All right, good morning. Welcome you to Christ Community Church. It is 1030, so we are, we're going to get started. If you are a visitor with us here today. We are so grateful uh, that you are here, and we get a welcome from you. The welcome cards are outside at this table downstairs. Uh, you can put them in the offering box or hand it to a person who is at the table, and they'll put it in the offering box for you. Or, if you want, you can text the number 94000 and text the word CCC guest, and that will take you to a very brief, short, digital welcome card. Also, that same number can take you to the bulletin if you text the number 94000, 94000 and text the word bulletin. It will take you to an uh, online link to our website that has our bulletin, upcoming events and information as well as updated on giving information as well. Uh, we are in a season of Lent. So during the season of Lent as a church, we have provided a, a Lenten guide to prepare our hearts for Easter. We have something to read, something to pray, something to memorize, as well as if you've given something up for Lent as well, that's, that's also helpful to prepare our, our hearts for worship on Easter. Uh, that can be found in the bulletin. It can also be found through social media where we have those things posted. If you are not on a service team, we'd recommend that you join a service team. Uh, being on a service team is a great way to get to know other people in the church. Not only that, it's a great way to serve the community. Uh, if you're a member at Christ Community Church or wanting to join it to be a member, what we say is everybody who's a member here is a minister. Like you are ministering to the other members of the church. And being a is a way to minister to other people in the church. Have different teams. You can be on the audio visual team with some guys like Jason and Eddie here. Uh, we have a set up and tear down team like the chairs you're sitting on. They don't live here during the week. They come from that corner. And so we got the tear down and set up team. Uh, we have a children's team that watches our, our nursery or works. church. We also have people who read scripture. Uh, I, think, I think Mike is reading scripture today. So I'm excited. I'm pumped. I always love it when Mike read scripture. Prepare, prepare for like scripture reading what was, on steroids. I was going to say like drama. I love it. All right. So we're excited for that today, but you can also join that team. Uh, you don't have to read like Mike if you're a scripture reader because no one else can. <laughs> totally embarrassing him right now. All right. Uh, also, upcoming events, we have our prayer walk. We do a Good Friday at Purser Park. We'll gather for fellowship and hot dogs, and then we will have signs spread out along the trail. And so we'll walk the trail around Purser Walk. We'll have a prayer guide for you. Uh, so go ahead and mark that in your calendars. Uh, time for a time of prayer and fellowship with the church and in our community. And we love doing things like that in the park, even when we end up in the church house. We want to keep doing stuff like that in the park because it's a way to engage and get to know our community. Uh, the first year we did that uh, as, as a church, not even we hadn't even started, but we did that prayer walk. And it was amazing to see people just kind of pick up and pray with us and being able to meet people and engage people. So it's a it's a fun time for the community. Also, update on the church house. If you're unfamiliar with what the church house is, it's the house across the street. Uh, there's about 1.4 acres over there with a large house, and we are turning property into a permanent home for our church. Uh, the house is being remodeled for nursery space and welcome space, and then we're adding a large sanctuary behind it as well as some bathrooms. Uh, that project's coming along quite nicely now. You can actually get a feel for what it's going to be like. Uh, we're still a couple months out, I believe, from being there. Uh, but that means we're in the process of starting to think about uh, decoration and what do we need to make this church house a, a church home? I don't know. How, how are we going to worship there? What are we going to sit on? So we need to raise funds for all those type of things. And so we're trying to raise $26,000 to outfit that facility uh, to be able to worship it. Uh, so currently we are almost at 20000 of the $26,000 goal. And I, I, I just got like this magical money in your bank account this week. I don't know. Um, but if you're looking for some way to give on that, uh, we, we, uh, we would love for you to consider 
that fund uh, to help us move into that church house. Um, this is what we teach about giving at Christ Community Church. We typically don't tithes, like everyone has to give 10%, but what we talk about is the heart we need to have in giving. And what we say is we need to give cheerfully and not under compulsion. We need to give generously to help other people. We need to give sacrificially for the kingdom. And that's kind of what we call people to in giving. Uh, but we thank you for your, your generosity already. Uh, we're not a large church, and so having that much raised that quickly is, is a beautiful thing. All right, let's start our call to worship. The book of Psalms, chapter 118, verse 1, says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he good. His faith love endures forever. Stay with me. Nothing can tear us down. Nothing can tear us from the grip of his mighty love. We've only glimpsed past affection, whispers of his heart and it's pouring out. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, and it's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. Loves and sends his son. The sun lays down his life for. He lavishes his love upon us. He calls us now his sons and daughters. He's Strong and it's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to light. Say that again. His love is deep, his love is wild, and it covers. Covers us. His love, is, his love is strong. It is furious. His love is sweet. His love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. Come behold the wondrous mystery. In the dawning of the King, He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in praise of humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended. To come flesh to ransom us. Come be old, the wondrous mystery. Be the perfect Son of Man in His living and covering, never trace or stain. 
notion. See the true matter Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Come behold the mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners, aims the Lamb in victory. See the price of redemption, see the Father's plans unfold. Unmeasured love unsold. The cold, the mystery, slain by death, the God of life. The could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope, Christ in power resurrected, as he will be when he comes. Come hold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, the God of life, Christ in power. Restrain him, praise the Lord, he is alive. Good morning, Christ Community Church. I want to welcome you here and I'd invite you to kind of prepare your hearts for a moment of confession as we go through the things we've been experiencing the last week, the last year, and all the challenges those have been brought with. So, as Paul was writing to the Romans, he said, as it's written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, and there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, all have alike become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And that's Romans 3, 10 through 12. So take the next few minutes, search your hearts out. If there's things you've been hiding or not addressing or living in unrepentant sin takes a moment to kind of confess those to God and prepare your hearts to receive his word and message today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church body, Lord, and let us be able to have the freedom to gather and worship with you in your house today, Lord. Bless them and watch over them and let us not fall away and be tempted by things of this world, Lord, and just stay focused on you. As Paul told the Romans, he said, blessed are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the person the Lord will never charge with sin. So Christ community, as we get ready to move into this period of communion, I would have you think for a second as how we've just prepared our hearts. We here believe in what's called open communion, and by that we mean that this you don't have to be a member of our church body to celebrate this with us. As long as you're a believer and a member of Christ's body at large, that's all we require. Now, if you're just here visiting or you're not sure if you made that commitment or you're not certain, then when the elements come by, I would have you just ask and just say, okay, just let, have these elements pass you by and reflect on the things that Christ did on the cross and what that means for your life. Additionally, if you are a believer, but you have sins you haven't confessed or things you haven't taken care of, 
I would also ask you to just re-examine your heart, confess those to the Lord, and pass the elements by at this time. So on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took the loaf of bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. In the same manner, he took the cup, and after supper, he said, this is my blood, and the new, the new covenant in my blood, and it's shed for you. So as often as you drink this cup, do this with me. And those are very important words. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ Community Church, I want you to remember that as often as you take this bread and you drink this cup, that you are doing this and proclaiming the Lord's death until his return. Do this in remembrance of me. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. I'll give you a minute there. Then Jesus left the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you the and all of this authority because it has been given over to you, and I can give it to anyone I want. 
if you then will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not test the Lord your God. After he finished every temptation, he departed from time. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mike. This this week has been spring break. So if you are a teacher, if you're a parent, you've probably really enjoyed this week, but it's over. Sorry. Uh, Eight more weeks for me until summer break is here. Forward to that. But this week has been a lot of fun. Uh, We've done done some work uh, around here and around the church house, and but we also had enough time to go and and spend a night camping, and and it was a typical camping trip. Uh, there was a massive windstorm and then a massive rainstorm where we were. So yeah, about typical camping trip. Uh, and then the best part of it was that we got to go fishing. And so the kids and I, we went out to uh, a tank, a stock tank, and we started dropping lines in, mostly fishing for perch, and it was quite a bit of fun. Uh, my father was there, and he's he's the real fisherman, so he he set a, set up a real rig and threw it out, and and we just left it out there. We went back. Went back to the campsite and ate dinner, and before we went to bed that night, we went back out to the tank to check that line. And uh, I was a lucky one. I I got to get there, and I got to start reeling it in. It wasn't long before I realized we had had caught something really, really good. It was a massive fight, and I pulled out the largest fish that I've ever reeled in in my life. It was massive. It's funny because my father was... And I, as I pulled it up, you can hear him say, he's like, oh, that's like a, that's like an eight to 10 pounder. And I'm like, oh, that's got to be 15 pounds. Uh, so a typical fishing story. Uh, but I was thinking about that story whenever I was reading our passage today, because our passage today is about temptation. And whenever James, the bro- brother of our Lord, is talking about this idea of temptation, he uses a fishing analogy. This is what James said each person did when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. That when we are tempted into sin, what causes us to sin is our own desires, and it's like a baited hook that, that draws us and entices us away from obedience to God and entrusting in God. And when we fall to this desire, when we fall to this temptation, we fall into sin. And then sin brings all sorts of destruction and death. When we turn to our passage in the Gospel of Luke today, we find that Jesus was being tempted. That Satan tried to bait a hook for our in this He tried to bait a hook for Christ, trying to get him to doubt the provision of God. He tried to bait a hook for our Lord, trying to make him doubt the the goodness of God. And then he tried to bait a hook a third time, trying to get him to doubt the, the word of God. And so what I want us to do today is to look at what temptation causes us to doubt. Because that's essentially what temptation does. That's how, that's how that, that hook is baited. It causes us to doubt those things, God's provision, his goodness, and his word. As we turn to our passage today in the book of Luke chapter 4, it's right after Jesus was baptized. 
Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit on him, and in the Holy Spirit, Christ goes out to the wilderness. The wilderness is often this picture of a place of of testing. Sometimes it's a picture of judgment, but Christ is out there in the wilderness, this place of trials. He's there for 40 days, and he's fasting. So he has nothing to eat. He's hungry. Have you ever noticed that oftentimes that temptation comes to you in a moment when you're weak? You're frustrated. You feel alone. Maybe you are alone and isolated. And it's whenever you're weak that those temptations seem to come on pretty strongly, causing us to doubt our God. Before we jump in to the what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to think about what tempts you. What, what would Satan put on that hook in your life to lure you away, to entice you? What are the desires of your heart that you might look to that desire for satisfaction more than you look to Christ for your satisfaction? What w- desires in your life where you say, this would make me happy more than Christ would make me me happy. Because what I want us to do is as we hit each of these points, doubting the the provision of God, the goodness of God, the word of God, I want you to think about your personal temptation in light of these doubts. So here Christ is. He's in the wilderness. Satan lures him away. And in verse 3, the devil comes to Jesus and he says, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Tell this stone to become bread. Jesus was tired. He's hungry. And Satan comes to tempt him. Notice how he tempts him. He tempts him in two ways here. Both ways he's calling him to doubt the provision of God. One is a very physical temptation. He is calling him to turn this stone to bread, to meet your physical needs. Now, this would not be difficult for Jesus, would it? I mean, let us not forget that Jesus is the creator of the universe. Let us not forget that, that Jesus created everything out of nothing. Let us not forget that this is a Jesus who is able to turn water into wine and to multiply fruit and to feed the multitudes. Would this be hard or difficult to Jesus? No. But what he is doing is he is saying, Jesus, trust in yourself more than you're trusting in God. Provide for yourself and don't trust in the provision of God. But there's a second way that Satan is calling Jesus to doubt God's provision, to doubt, to doubt what God has provided. If you remember when Jesus was being baptized in Luke, whenever he came up out, there was a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son and you I am well pleased. Jesus was provided for by God. He was provided this gift from the Father of hearing the Father's delight in him. And here comes Satan calling on Jesus, saying, Jesus, you need evidence. You need proof. What God has provided is not enough. Use your own power to prove to yourself who you are. Satan was calling on Jesus vision of God. And we see that this has been Satan's, his schemes from the very beginning. Even going back to the book of Genesis chapter three, when Adam and Eve were tempted, Adam and Eve were surrounded by bounty. Every tree in the garden producing fruit that they could eat and be satisfied with, they were provided for by God. But here comes the Satan telling Eve that she needs to take this fruit that God had restricted, saying, God is holding back from you. Provide for yourself and take the fruit. We find that our temptation causes us to doubt the provision of God. Now, earlier I said I wanted you to get your temptation. What is your desire? How is baited to draw you into sin. And I wanted to look at it through the lens of these three doubts. How does your particular temptation call doubt the provision of God? Do you think I have to take care of things myself because I have to make things happen? 
or are you trusting in the goodness of God? We were reminded by Jesus when he was talking about the sparrows. He said, you know, sparrows are, are so many of them out there, but not all without the Heavenly Father knowing about it. He said, how much more important are you than one of those sparrows? Whenever we begin to, to th- take things into our own hands and try to force them and control them, what we are essentially doing is saying, God, we don't trust your provision. As reading this, I was reminded of, of a story of, of my wife when we were dating. She uh, had her first teaching job at a pretty difficult high school. Uh, she graduated from A&M, and she did her student teaching at Bryan High School there uh, next to A&M. And, uh, and so she just went to work for them that next year, and it was a difficult year. Um, man, to be a 22-year-old teacher in a room of sophomore boys and girls it's tough. And I remember the struggles she had that first year and the difficulty she faced. And I went up there to visit her one time in her classroom and on her desk, she had a verse card that was prominent on her desk. And it was Matthew 6 verse 11 that said the simple verse, give us this day our daily bread. It's a line from prayer from the Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter 6, and I asked her about it because I, I thought, what a, what a random verse to have on, on your desk. And she said, well, yeah, I, I have that there because I need, I need to know that, that Christ has me for today, and he will provide for this day, and I want to trust him now in the moment. And then tomorrow when I get here, I'll have that verse in front of me, and I will be reminded that Christ provides for me today. He's there for me. He will provide for me. Oftentimes, I think in our minds, we think we have to have all of our life mapped out. Every variable that could happen, we think we need to to plan for so that there's no surprise and whatever happens, we're good. You ever feel that way? If this year has taught us anything, it's that we can't plan that way. We can't expect to know every turn of the tide in our world, every course history might take. But what we can do is trust that our God is a provider and that we need when we need it. Are you trusting God today? Are you trusting God in, in your desires and in the temptations you face off of those desires? Are you saying, God, I am putting this in your hands Or like Eve, are you reaching out to take the fruit for yourself, lacking a trust in God's provision? God, in Christ, whenever Satan tempted him, whenever Satan tempted Jesus, in verse 4, Jesus said, man must not live on bread alone. He declared his trust in the Father, and he withstood the temptation. Temptation we see is Satan calling Christ to doubt the goodness of God. After Jesus withstood the first temptation, in verse 5, so Satan took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I trust. Think about why Christ came. Christ came for the nations. Christ came to to rule in authority over the nations, to sit on the throne. And here is Satan saying, Jesus, if you came for this, if this is what you're here for, I can give it to you right here, right now. No cross, no betrayal, no death. Fast track to sit on a throne. What was Satan cause, trying to cause doubt? And trying to cause doubt of God. That God was calling Christ to go a hard road, a hard path that would lead him to the cross, that would lead him to death, that would lead him to betrayal. And Satan doesn't have to be that hard. It reminds me of the Garden of Eden. Whenever Satan was tempting Eve, 
This is what he said. It says this in Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat of it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan was trying to tempt Eve by telling Eve that God was trying to keep the good things in life from her. God knows that 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 if you eat this one fruit, you will be like God yourself, and he is keeping good things from you. When he went to Christ in the wilderness, he said, God is trying to cause you to go through hardship that you don't need to go through. All you have to do is to bow your knee and to worship me. Oftentimes, I think Satan tempts us to doubt the goodness of God by saying God wants to keep things from you. If you're my age, I'm, I'm 41, uh, you might remember what people used to say about God in the 80s and 90s time frame, that people would say God is like a cosmic killjoy, and he wants to keep good things from you. They would say things like the Bible is just a list of no's telling you what not to do, restricting your fun. And that was one of the big lies of the day. And I think the big lies of today have changed society we have done away with morality we've done away with right and wrong and instead of saying that god wants to kill your fun and instead of saying that god wants to keep good things from you what they is something like this well god wants me to be happy and if god wants me to be happy then he will not restrict any of the desires i have in my life and any desires i have in my life must be good We become our own morality. What are we doing? In both cases, in both of those lies where we're saying that God wants me to be miserable or where we're saying that God wants me to be happy so I can do anything I want, what we are doing is we're essentially saying that that God either wants to keep me from my desires or God's allowing me to do anything I want. Is based upon this same lie. And the truth of the matter is, is that God does want you to be happy. But God wants you to be happy and satisfied in him. Because it is the only true way to be happy. When we rebel against the commandments of God, essentially what we are do- doing is we're saying, God, we do not trust that you know what is good for us. Parents in here have this same conversation with their children all the time. Kids will come to a parent, and the parent will give them and tell them to do something, and there might be that initial pushback that, that I'm, yeah, I'm upset because this is not what I want. What are they doubting? They are doubting that we know what's best for them. No, you need lots. It's time for bed. I'm not trying to ruin your fun. I'm not trying to take the goodness of life away from you. I'm trying to give you what you need. And we might look down at children for that conversation, but it's the same conversation that we have with God. God, why don't you want me to be happy? Why don't you want me to have these desires of my heart when God is saying, I know what you need, child. Trust me and trust my goodness. We are called by Christ, we are called by Scripture to trust and obey our God. Why? Because God is good. He knows for us. He is caring and He is sovereign. Trust the goodness of God as you think about your sin, as you think about your desires. How is your sinful desires, how is your temptation geared to make you distrust the goodness of God? How does your sin and temptation cause you to doubt the character of our God? What do you believe that God is holding back from you? And are you willing to trust that he is good, that he knows what is best for you? 
The third temptation that we find Satan tempting Jesus with is one where he is trying to get Jesus to doubt the word of God. He's trying to get Jesus to doubt the word. Satan tempts Jesus to worship him. Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Both times, Jesus confronts Satan by using so Satan says, I'm going to change my tactic. In verse 9, it says that Satan took Jesus to Jerusalem. He had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. This pinnacle in the temple, if, if it's where most scholars believe, is about 450 foot up off the ground because you have the height of the temple, but where the temple is situated, the valley that goes even further down. So 450 feet up, Satan says, if you are the son of God, once again, calling Jesus to prove himself. Are you really the son of God? He says, if you really are, throw yourself off and prove it because look at what scripture says. And he quotes Psalm 91 to him. And he says, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. And they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your stone. What is Satan doing here? But twisting the word of God. One of the things that Satan will do, one of the ways that we are tempted into sin is that we tend to twist the word of God. Think about Eve back in the garden. Whenever Eve was in the garden in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, what did Satan say to her? He said, did God do this? And he is trying to doubt on the word of God. How do the word of God how do we know if someone around us is twisting the word of God because members remember you are members of one each other of one another it is your job that if you hear someone else in this church twisting the word of God it's your job to gently and love to question their interpretation of the Bible but how do we do this I think there's I just want to give three quick ways that we can know if we're twisting the word of God in our own heart if it's happening around us this is the first thing we need to understand here, is that we read Scripture. We need to read Scripture in a literal sense. Now, I didn't say read it literally. I said read it in its literal sense, and there's a difference there. Most people criticize Christians by saying the Bible's literally uh, or literal. So why don't you cut off your right hand when it causes you to sin? Why don't you gouge out your eye when it causes you to sin? calls us to do and what we would say is yes christ said if your right hand causes you to sin cut it off and throw it away if your right eye causes you to sin to gouge it out and throw it away but what we say is being a hard literalist here he's not calling us to actually mutilate our bodies but he is making a point about the nature of sin and fighting sin He's using hyperbole. He's using exaggeration. So it's our to read Scripture in the way that the original authors intended it to be understood. If they are using exaggeration, we read it as exaggeration. If they are reading something as historical, we read it as historical. We trust that the Bible was written for us to be understood. And Jesus believed this. So we understand Scripture in its literal sense. The second thing we need to do to make sure we don't twist Scripture is we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Since we believe that the Word of God is without error, since we believe that the Word of God is inspired and true, when we need a Scripture to help find understanding about what that passage means, we can go to other places in the Bible where it's talking about the same issue and we allow scripture to shed light on itself 
because we believe that the Bible is going to be consistent in its teachings. So if you read a part of the Bible and it, you come up with this interpretation that other parts of the Bible is like, man, your interpretation's off, we have to come to the conclusion that our interpretation is off. So we read the Bible in the literal sense. We read the Bible and allow Scripture to shed light on Scripture, let Scripture interpret Scripture. And then finally, I think one of the things that we do is make sure we are reading the Bible in community. Read the Bible in community. You are in the line of a cloud of witnesses. You are in the line of giants in the faith before you. And one of the things that we can do as Christians is look at the teachings of the church. Now, has the church always been on the same page? Well, of course not. That's why we have different denominations, and there's been breaks over different points of doctrines. But we do believe that we can look to the church and say, is this a new idea I'm having, or has this been consistent throughout the history of the church? If the history of the church has been consistent on it, we don't have the freedom to say, I've got this new revelation that 2,000 years the Christian church has been wrong and I'm right. But what we need to do is to allow that history to teach us and form us. We need to remember that we're of one another. And so when we come to our discipleship groups and our small groups, our community, and we present an idea about Scripture, if everyone else in that group says, man, I'm just wondering about your doctrine there. I'm wondering about your doctrine there. That cause. Because Christ has given us the church to help stand Scripture together. Our ultimate authority is the Word of God. And as we look at Luke chapter 4, time and time and time again, Jesus confirms that the word of God is true, that the word of God is sufficient, that the word of God can help us in a time of doubting. My question for you this morning is, are you trusting in the word of God? Are you hiding that word in your heart? And how often? Because we have to realize that everything else out there in the world is trying to form you to look like the world. And Scripture and the Spirit through Christ. And you have to ask yourself, what are my meals composed of here? I anyone here ever watched the movie or the documentary Super? It is fascinating. I don't know if it's on Netflix or weird, but it's this guy who decided to make a documentary, and he was going to eat McDonald's every meal of every day. I want to say for, I forget how long, if it's a month or whatever. But he was going to go to his local McDonald's, and he was going to order something new on the menu every time. And if they said, super, do you want to be supersized? He said, yep, supersize me. And his goal was to eat everything of every meal. Halfway through this process, his doctors uh, came to him and said, listen, you've got to like, you are going to kill yourself. Why? Because every meal he had was unhealthy. It was filled with preservatives. I have a friend down in Pearland. His daughter, 11 years ago, did the science experiment to see how long a Big Mac and fries would last. They still pull it out every 11 years, and it's still there. It still looks the same, right? So here, here we are on a full diet of Mickey D's in the world. Every Spotify playlist we listen to, every YouTube we're streaming, every, every show we watch, every conversation we have, every news article that passes our news, we're taking it in and we're, we're having Big Mac after Big Mac. And then once a week we come in and we sit down to hear the word of God and we have a nice salad. Is that one salad a week enough to sustain your body? N not, not after a week of Mickey D's. We need to make sure that we have a steady diet of truth. We need to have a steady diet of, of the Word of God filling us and forming us throughout the week. And we're at a time 
April, picked up our Bible reading plan in January, and that's months in the past. We haven't picked it up. You might have started new Bible reading plans, and you got a few weeks or a few days into it, it falls by the wayside. And you can look at that, and you can, you can kick yourself, and you can beat yourself up over it. Or you know what you can do? You can just pick it back up again. You can start a new Bible reading plan. There is no judgment in that. Where there's judgment is where if you just lay your Bible on the ground and stop. But as long as you're moving forward, saying, I'm going to pick it up again, I'm going to start again, there will be a cumulative effect of, of the healthy Word of God forming you in your life. Jesus knew the Word of God. It formed him and allowed him to fight the schemes of the enemy. When you think about your desire, when you think about the temptation in your life, do you have verses that you can go to that speak to those desires? Do you have verses that speak to those temptations so that when you are weak, when you are hungry and you want that desire, you can go back to the Word of God for strength? We are called to trust God's word. We are called to trust his goodness, to trust his provision. And I want to end with this idea. I think all of us know that we're weak. I'm weak. You're weak. We're, we're all weak. We're in a room full of weak people. And when temptation comes upon us, no matter how strong we might think we are, we oftentimes fall to that temptation. There's one way that we can look at this passage in the book of Luke, and we can say there's all sorts of strategies in here for us to fight temptation. Memorizing Scripture, presenting Scripture, and those are good strategies. But I think there's even a greater truth in here, and it's the truth that Christ succeeded where Adam and Eve failed that Christ withstood temptation on our behalf. Listen to what Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 5. He said, For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so through one man's obedience many will be made righteous. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying we are all children of the same parents. You and I, we are children of Adam. We are children of Eve. And we have the same family look. And that same family look of a broken sinner. But the promise in Romans chapter 5 that said, just as we all fell in Adam, we all will be made alive in Christ. Because where Adam and Eve failed to trust the provision, the goodness, and the word of God, Christ succeeded. And he succeeded and died. The book of Hebrews says this about Christ. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Christ Community Church, brothers and sisters, know that in Christ you have righteousness. In Christ you have succeeded, not because of your own goodness, not because of your own strength, because of that of Jesus. He has gone before you. You are righteous in him. You are free in him. And because of his work, we now can fight the sin and the desires and the temptations that lead us away from God. And when we fail, we remember we have a great high priest who brings us back into the fold. Those words that Christ received in his baptism are also words that are spoken over you. Whenever Christ came out of the waters, God from heaven said, This is my beloved Son. 
And when you have faith in Christ, those words are spoken. This is my beloved son. This is my daughter. They are mine. And if we are Christ's, then nothing is from his love. That truth, that glorious truth, drive you to fight the sin, the temptation, and the false desires in your life. Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you for your provision. You care for us, O oh Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We can trust you to do what is right and to know what is right. We thank you for your word that shows us who you are. May our trust always be in you and in your son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us. May we walk in your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We got a mic? Oh, yeah, I guess. Thank you, whoever did that. Um, Jason told me that I should warn y'all. I've added a verse. Um, so when you think we're done, we're only halfway there. It's the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, Holy Ghost. From all who dwell beneath the skies, let the Creator's praise arise. Redeemer's name be so through every land by every tongue. Amen. Let us remain standing for the benediction. Christ, Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So leave this place knowing that in victory over sin and over the false desires in your life, walk in his victory. You are dismissed.